as I showed you yesterday, when uh, you want to minimize, you change your, your, your velocity, you change your control. And so the others are going to, to react. And at the end of the day, you, you need to find some equilibrium. So this was the example we had yesterday for the cost functional. This was what I called a potential energy inside the cost functional. Well, then we introduced the notion of Nash equilibrium. And then I explained to you that, well, we had to derive intuitively what happens when n tends to infinity. So when the number of particles tends to infinity. And the way I did so was to say that certainly this was a good point to, to have this on that. So this on that says that at equilibrium, we could, we could think that the model or the equilibrium is going to retain the symmetry of the model. And when I speak about symmetry, it means that I think or I postulate the fact that at equilibrium, the equilibrium feedback that is chosen by the particles is itself symmetric. Here, symmetric means in my mind that to implement the equilibrium strategy, so to compute the velocity that I should play at equilibrium. So this is a kind of compromise between all the particles or all the players. What I have to do is, uh, what I have to do is, let me just, give me just a minute, I'm sorry about this. Um, is just to see my own state and the state of the others as being described by the empirical measure. And so this was, this was the notation that we have been using. Oh, this is the notation we have been using for the empirical measure. And the key fact was to say, well, it might be possible, or this might be reasonable to say that in fact, this function does not depend on n. I know that this is a bit subtle for you to understand this. I'm going to show you not today, but tomorrow that it makes sense to have this assumption. But this is, this is an intuition to say that, I'm sorry, asymptotically, no, this is not the, this one. Asymptotically, um, the feedback function is going to stabilize. So as a function of the private state of the player and the function and the state of the population. And so this was enough to say that if you make this assumption, then certainly you can guess that in the limits at the equilibrium, the state of the population is going to converge to something. And in particular, the empirical distribution themselves are going to converge to some theoretical distribution. And this is the key point. In fact, this is the only thing that we really need to formulate what an equilibrium should be when capital N is equal to infinity. And so this was the next part of the analysis yesterday. And this was the fixed point problem that I described to tell you what was a notion of minfield game equilibrium or solution when N is equal to infinity. And what I told you is that you wanna find the equilibrium state of the population as a fixed point to some mapping or as the solution to a fixed point problem. So this is the white, the, the, the blue, the blue, the blue line that you have in the in the box on line number three in the slides. And to find this fixed point, you say that a solution for this fixed point problem should be a flow of probability measures. So it should describe once again, the state of the population at equilibrium when time is going to evolve. So each of these, of these elements here, each of them, these are, each of, of them is, this is a probability measure. I put a two because we, we require in practice that there is sufficiently a strong uh, integrability assumption and then you freeze this, it's going to evaluate or to evolve, I'm sorry, to evolve with time. And you say, given this environment, I'm just associating 
the control problem for one player in the population. So with the notation that we use, this is just alpha. And here you can remove this. This is just the identity matrix. And then you solve within the environment, you solve this stochastic control problem. And you say that the law of the optimal trajectory has to be equal to the input. So this is the way you get the fixed point. So this is exactly uh, this item number three in the slide. So this is what we did yesterday uh, in the second hour of the uh, of the lecture. But as I told you, this is not a proof of convergence. This is just a way to guess what should be a solution. But now the difficulty is that even though you do that, um, you would like to to get something that is somehow more tractable for the fixed point. So, so you, you should be thinking of having a description of item two and item three in terms of maybe more tractable equations or some things that could be more familiar with your own background or your own knowledge. And so this is exactly what I did. I told you that when the environment is fixed, then you have to associate with the optimization or the optimal control problem. You have to associate with that a value function. And this value function just describes what is the optimal cost to a given player in the population when this player starts from state small x. So this is this small x that you have that you have here. So this is this one. And the, it starts at initial time t. And the environment is completely frozen. So you see that this guy here, this is completely frozen. And so you minimize. And so this is something that everybody knows, or this is well known in the field, how to do that. And we know that u is going to be the solution of hamilton jacobi bellman equation, which is described exactly on this slide. So these are things that we wrote yesterday. But now you say you have to remember of the fixed point condition. And what we said is that, well, that's nice because once you have solved the, the HAB equation, you know what is the optimal strategy when the, when the environment is fixed. So when I have fixed the candidate mu t for being the equilibrium, I know what is the best response to my stochastic control problem. So the one I had in item two here. So I know that in this item two, the best feedback alpha when mu is frozen, this was the question that we had yesterday at the end of the lecture. This is given by mine by, let's say in my problem in the one I had minus the gradient of the value function. If, if the model is a bit more complicated, this is a bit more complicated shape but I don't add, it doesn't really matter. So this is what we had. And at the end of the day, we were saying that once we have identified the optimal feedback, then we were able to say what is the dynamics of the law of the optimal state. This was given by a Fokker Planck equation. This is what you have on the middle of the page. And so at the end of the, of the day, you get a forward backward system. But this forward backward system is a forward backward system of two PDEs. And so this is what we have to study now, right? And so I'm going to restart uh, with the study of this system. And then after that, I will show you, or I will tell you other approaches to solve the, the minfield game. And I will make the connection with related problems of mean field type, which are not games, but still involving some optimization, uh, let's say some optimization problem. And if I have time before the end of the lecture today, I will go back to the end particle system, at least in a simple fashion. This won't be exactly the whole proof. I will do that during the next lectures, but this will be a way to make a connection with the particle system. So uh, let me go back to my uh, to my pad or to my uh, notes. So here, this is the lecture, the notes that we have. So you will find a PDF file of this on the file sender uh, link that I just attached. 
to the chat. And so we will now resume with a new file. And so this is lecture two. Okay, so the plan for today is really, I want to have a look at solvability, I should say results, but maybe this is more methodology, methodology. Uh, so for the forward backward system that we had yesterday. So I'm going to use quite often this notion of forward backward. And I really insist on this fact that this is something that is absolutely frequent in, um, in midfield games. So uh, I will use the, the, the shorter notation FB for that. So the FB system. Then I would like to speak about maybe other approaches, but in fact, all of them are related. And three, connection with other types of minfield, so MF for minfield problems. And if I have time, but I'm not sure about this because usually I'm rather slow, go back to the finite game, not in a completely exhaustive manner, but at least uh, one way to make the connection and just to show you that what we are doing makes sense. So uh, first one, so methodology for solving the forward backward system. Okay. Let me, let me uh, just uh, first make uh, so, so a recap of the shape of the system. So shape of the system. So now you only really enter the theory of mental games. And in fact, if you have a look at many, many papers in the field, as I told you yesterday, more or less, they directly start from the shape of the MFG system. And they take for granted, for granted the fact that you know the story that is behind. You know why we have this system. So they directly restart from the shape of the forward backward system. And so we had two equations yesterday. And so we had dt mu t, so this was for the state of the population, minus one half of delta mu t, minus the divergence of dx u t dot mu t. And this was equal to zero. And on the other side, you have dt u t plus one half delta u t plus f dot mu t minus one half of dx u t squared is equal to zero. And the boundary condition is u t, maybe let me remove the x. This is g dot mu t. So really, really, I remember that the first one, so you have to understand the meaning of this equation. If you don't understand the meaning of this equation, certainly there is no interest for you to listen to my lectures. So mu t is understood as the equilibrium state of the population at time t and ut is the optimal cost 
for a tagged player starting from T and evolving in the environment mu s. Okay, so these are two PDs. These are two PDs. Certainly, if you remember what we did yesterday, if you want to attack the problem, you could say, I'm going to solve one of these two equations when the solution of the other one is known. So this is what we call decoupling the two equations. So let me remind you that this one is a HJB equation and this one is a Fokker-Planck equation. In fact, certainly you know results about HJB equation and when mu t is frozen, when mu t is fixed, even though the, the equation for, for you is nonlinear PDE, this is not that difficult to solve this, this equation. So remark, so the remark that you can have is that if mu t is fixed, well, provided that this is not completely, let's say irregular, but I don't want to insist at this moment, when I say fixed intuitively, it should be not so bad in time. So a bit of continuity in time, I will go back to this question next, but let's say that if mu t is fixed, uh, certainly solving the, the HJB equation is not, is not so difficult. So solving HJB is well known. And you have a result, and so this is a claim. If you take the coefficients f and g to be bounded, smooth in the x variable with bounded derivatives, let's say. derivatives with sufficiently many or of sufficiently many order, then there is a classical solution to the HAB equation. There exists a classical solution to the HJB equation. And in fact, this solution, so this solution that is called U, for sure it depends on the choice that you have performed for the environment. So for your mu that is here. Uh, this guy is classical, but this is also bounded and with bounded derivatives. And when I say bounded derivatives, the key fact is that if I have a look at the first order derivative, which is exactly, there is one equation. Do you have a equation? Okay, if there is a question, please ask. Siham, you raised your hand. Do you have any question? No. So the point is that so dxu also is bounded. So so when I say bounded derivative, so sorry. Uh, 
So dx u bound, let me write this in this way. Well, you could wonder how to get, uh, to get this, uh, this result. So this is part of the folklore of the results of, of, of nonlinear PDEs. But there is an easy way here to get the result, which is to use what we call the Kohlhoff transformation. So a strategy in that case, I'm not claiming that it works in any situation, but a possible strategy to do this is to change u or to consider vtx as being the exponential of utx. And if you make this change of variable, then you are going to linearize the equation. And once you have a linear equation for V, this is for sure much, much easier to solve. And then you come back to you by taking the logarithm. So then the equation or the PD for V becomes linear. So this is a trick that is not possible for any Nonlinear PDEs. This is absolutely fitted to the type of equation I have here for my benchmark example. Anyway, we know how to generalize the results, even though we don't have this transformation, but here this is really useful. And this transformation is called the Kohlhopf transformation. And you can find many of the original papers on minfield games using this transformation. This was widely, widely used in the very first articles. And let me mention, for instance, uh, the, um, all the works by Olivier Guéon, who was a PhD student of, uh, of uh, Pierre Williams. And uh, he did or he tackled many examples use, using this transformation. So I'm not going to do the proof. This is just to, uh, to, to, to advertise the strategy. What I want to insist on is that in these results, so this is just a claim, uh, you have to believe me, uh, I don't have time to explain the whole machinery for this kind of intermediary results. So this is the same as yesterday for propagation of cows. So I just have to, to tell you a story and you have to believe me, but you can really do the proof. Uh, here usually when, when you have the assumptions on F and G, so the, the coefficients, the running cost, and the terminal cost. Something that is really standard is to assume that all the bounds that you have uh, for the function and for the solution themselves are completely independent of the measure arguments. Because you have to remember that the functions that you have, both f and g, so f and g maps rd across the space of probability measures, into R. So, so each time you have some bounds, and in particular smoothness, for sure this is smoothness in X in the first parameter, not, not in, the, in the measure argument. But then you require your bounds to be uniform in the measure argument. You have some results for which the bounds are just local, but this, these are not things I'm going to touch today. This would be part of the of the extension of the minfield game theory to, to more complicated models. But so let's say that the bounds usually are required to be uniform in the measure argument. So here you could find me a little bit uh, a sloppy in, in the formulation of the assumption. The first thing is that I don't want to have long sets of assumption as otherwise I would spend for hours writing all the assumption. And, and the other thing is that I prefer to explain to you intuitively why we need this assumption. So the fact that we need F and G to be bounded, this is mostly because then we take the exponential. And if you don't have bounded things, it could be a disaster for the exponential. And as a result, U itself is bounded. In fact, for the gradient, for the band of the gradient, it, it's, it's going to be hold or to hold away from the boundary if you just have F and G bounded. But now if you want to reach the boundary, then you need G to be bounded as to be to have a, a bounded gradient as well. So you need to you need G to be Lipschitz. And if you want even more derivatives, 
for sure away from the boundary due to the smoothing effect of the heat kernel, this is fine. And you can have second order derivatives. But if you want to go up to the boundary and uniformly uh, in time, then you need to assume more on the shape of G and let's say G to be at least C2 if you want your solution to be C2 up to the boundary. So it really depends on the types of classical solution that you want to have at the end of the day, and you just have to adapt this. Okay, anyway, so this is just to say that I just explained to you how to solve the HAB equation. And now for sure you could say, well, once I have done that, I can have a fixed point mapping. And so it leads you to say, so once we have, once we have solved the HJB equation, we can design a mapping as follows. So what is your mapping? So you take, you start from the environment. So once again, you have to really to insist on this. I know that I repeat myself, but um, this is teaching by the way. So uh, environment is really the flow of probability measures. So these are your mu t's. So you have to see as this as a path that takes time into the space of probability measures, okay? And usually what you require is that those probability measures, as I spoke about yesterday, have a finite second moment. So they are square integrable. And most of the time you also require a bit of continuity on this, uh, on this um, path for the simple reason that if you really want to have classical solution to the HAB equation, then you need your coefficient to be continuous in time. And so you need time dependence to be continuous in mu itself. So usually we require it to be continuous. for the W2 topology. So now it becomes a bit more difficult for you because the topology W2 is the one that, or the W2 distance, maybe, maybe this is easier for you if I say distance. This is the one that we defined yesterday. So this is exactly the one that I defined in lecture one. Okay. But I'm going to explain to you next that this is absolutely well fitted to what we are going to do. And somehow in our setting, this continuity is almost for free. And now what do you do? Once you have this, you map this environment. So this is a big arrow map to onto the solution to the HJB equation. And so what is the solution of this HJB equation when this is exactly the guy that I denoted by mu. Maybe I'm going to put an underline just to say that this is the whole, this is the whole trajectory. So in my notation here, this should be an underline or there should be an underline to say that this is the whole path on which the solution to the HJB equation is going to depend. Right, uh, and so this is really a classical solution. And you see that if you want to go really to the end of the analysis and you want to have time continuity of the time derivative in the HJB equation. So if you want to have a classical solution, you have to wonder about the time continuity of this object. So certainly, as I told you, you need time continuity here. So you see that I assumed mu t to vary continuously with respect to the W2 topology. And so in turn, you have to require that F is continuous in the measure argument 
in the W2 seance. So this is something that I didn't say, but you can put this. Uh, usually we require F to be continuous in the measure arguments with respect to W2. If you don't like this because you find it a bit too, uh, too complicated, you can forget it. This is not really needed. This is just for those of you who had this question in mind. Once you have the classical solution, what do you do? Well, you want to map this, you want to map this onto the solution of the forward equation. But I'm going to cheat because somehow I know what this solution should be. And I'm going to interpret directly the solution of this equation as the law of a stochastic process. And so this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to say, well, I map this onto So the law of xt, so now I come back to probability. And with the law of xt, or with xt being given by exactly the trajectory that is associated with the solution of the HAB equation. So here, this is mu underline. Okay, so. Don't forget this, not, this notation. This is the one that we had, and this is the law. And here you require that in this system or in this equation, the law of x0 is exactly mu0, which is the initial state of the population. And now really, in fact, the law of xt is the solution of the, of the, of the Fokker-Planck equation. And the question is, you want to find a fixed point to this. Just a remark, you see that, maybe this is a simple exercise, prove that the law of xt is automatically one half other continuous with respect to W2. For a constant here, for a constant C that is independent, that is independent of the input mu. So as I told you, the time continuity of the law is almost for free because once you have done somehow one step in your, in your mapping for the fixed point, then directly you get a very strong bound on the smoothness of the output. So let me just, you can do this exercise, but let me give you the way or show you the way it works. So, the way it works is exactly connected with the computation that we did. And this is the reason why I want to emphasize this exercise, because this is a good way for you to get familiar with this W distance in case you don't know that, but I'm sure, and I know that some of you know this distance work very well, but I'm not sure that this is the case of all of you. So you take uh, two times, two instance. So let's say that S is less than T is less than capital T. And you have a look at the W2 distance between the two, uh, the, two, the two distributions. And you use the bound that I told you yesterday. I said, well, that's very easy when you have random variables because you have an obvious, an obvious upper bound uh, for the W2 distance. And so this is the one you have here. But now you come back to the dynamics and you know what is xt minus xs, it's going to be the integral from s to t of minus t x u r x r d r plus b t minus b s. Don't worry about the fact that there is a solution to the equation for x. I, I said this yesterday. 
the simple fact that the axio is bounded is going to enforce existence and uniqueness of a solution. These are all the results by Veretenikov. But here you can also use directly the fact that the axio is, is certainly a Lipschitz if you have a very strong solution to the HAB equation. So there is no, no problem with this. And now you say, well, this guy is bounded by some constancy. So let me put a mu underline in the notation to be completely consistent with what I did. And then, well, I know that the L2 norm of the increments of a brown motion is less. Well, there is the dimension. So let's say that this is less than a constant T minus S, right? And so at the end of the day, I would get C minus T S. So the root of T minus S. So this is fine and I get I get the fact that this is Helder continuous. I will use that next. So this is not only an exercise, but this will be useful in the rest of the discussion. Okay, good point. Now the question is, I would like to solve this fixed point problem. But now the bad point is that this is a difficult, this is a difficult thing to solve it, at least by, let's say, standard or naive arguments. So now the bad news this is not easy to solve the fixed point problem if if i go back so here you have this big mapping with the two rows so if 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 you want and use black chalk. I have a big mapping that maps the input onto the output. So here I take this is the input mu, and this is the output, which is exactly given by these laws. Let me call this big mapping capital Phi. And for sure, you could say, well, in order to solve the fixed point, I'm going to prove that Phi is a contraction well, for a suitable topology uh, on the space that I use for the inputs. But this is, this is quite a hopeless argument. This is very difficult to prove that capital Phi is a contraction unless time is, is really small. And this is something that I would like to explain to you. And, and those of you know this really well in the audience. So here, let's say that phi is not a contraction. Well, this is a bit sloppy here to say that because I should specify the type of topology that I'm using, but I don't want to, to make it too precise. Let's say that except if t is small. You could say, well, this is this is strange because I have some PDEs and usually for evolution problem, well, maybe I can use some contraction arguments or I do this in small time and then I iterate and this is not that difficult. But here, this is more than an evolution problem because in fact, you have two directions for time and these two directions are conflicting. And this is exactly the reason why this is so difficult. So the big, big problem is that the two directions of time are conflicting. In fact, the system you have, you can think of a one dimensional version of this system. Think for instance, of a 1D version of this system. Um, well, um, what could this be? Well, I would have a forward ODE 
instead of a forward PDE, and a backward ODE instead of a backward PDE. And so the forward ODE, this would be something as, maybe let me use black chalk, x dot is, let's say, b of x t y t, and so x zero is prescribed. And in the backward ODE, I would have y dot is, let's say, minus f x t y t, and with yt is equal to g of xt. OK, so this is a two-point boundary problem in dimension one. And in fact, if you take f, b, f, and g to be linear, you can cook up examples for which you, have, you don't have existence or uniqueness or none of them. So we know that this is quite bad, these kind of things, except maybe if the coefficients are Lipschitz and time is small. So if B, F, and G Lipschitz in all the arguments, then there is existence and uniqueness by contraction arguments. So this would be a Cauchy-Lipschitz theory. If time, so here time, for those of you who do not see where time is, this is really the boundary condition in my backward equation. So this is the same time as before. This is the time where I see the terminal value of the forward equation. And so if time is small enough, and when I say small enough, implicitly I require T to be small with respect to the Lipschitz constant of my coefficients B, F, and G. In fact, for those of you who know hyperbolic uh, equation, this is exactly what happens for hyperbolic equation because uh, you can think of the characteristic system of, of a hyperbolic equation as being a forward backward OD. And if you start from something that is Lipschitz, then you can expect to get on a small interval of time, one poseness of the characteristic system. But after some time, you may have some shocks. And this is exactly what happens here. I will go back to this point next. OK, so you cannot, you can, OK, I, I forgot to say, but counterexample, counterexample. If you take F, G, and B linear, so we can find example. without existence or without uniqueness. I don't have in mind exactly the shape of the coefficients. There was a very nice uh, book a long time ago on the stochastic version of this type of equation. This was by Ma and Young um, on forward backward stochastic equations. And there, was, there were these kind of examples in the book. So this is around the 90s. Uh, I'm sure the, the, the counter examples are certainly much older than the book itself, but this is, this is, this is a way where, this is a place where you can find these, uh, these examples. Anyway. So you could say what to do for existence or what to do for uniqueness if you don't have, if you don't have uh, a solution to this equation, if you don't have a contraction. So basically, you have to separate things in two parts. So what people do is that they address separately existence on one side and uniqueness on another side. Um, this is exactly what I'm going to do um, because of the fact that we don't have a direct contraction argument. So the conclusion of this analysis is that We need to separate existence 
and uniqueness analysis. Okay. I'm going to start with uniqueness. Um, so for the moment, I don't have any existence result, but I'm just, I just would like to, to go more into the discussion about the connection with hyperbolic equations. So more about, oh, let's say, sorry, uniqueness. So uniqueness is, is a difficult equation, or I should not say difficult, but I should say that this is a non-typical regime in midfield games. What does it mean that this is non-typical? It means that in fact, most of the time you expect not to have uniqueness. And this is quite an issue somehow, because if you think of, let's say numerical methods uh, without uniqueness, this is a bit difficult uh, because you can guess of uniqueness, but more than uniqueness, stability. And so if you don't have uniqueness, you don't have any strong stability. So this, this might be an issue. Or you can find also some, some methods that could converge numerically to some solution, even though you don't have uniqueness. But then in that case, you have subtle question about what do you select? And this is a question that I like very, very much. And it seems to be, uh, uh, there are some results, but this is a quite open question to know when you have multiple equilibria or multiple solutions, what would be somehow the right ones, exactly as for some types of, of PDEs, you, have, you may have plenty of solutions, but at the end of the day, you have some criterion to select one of them or some of them amongst all the possible ones. And so here, this is a quite fascinating question. Anyway, let me go back to what could be a criterion to guarantee that you have uniqueness. And so since this is a non-typical situation, you don't have so many criteria. And the main, the main condition that is used is called the last reliance monotonicity criterion. So really it goes back to the works of uh, Lassery and Lyons uh, 06, 07. So this is something that they understood uh, really quickly. And since uh, I have to say that this has been the mostly or the most popular uniqueness uh, criterion in practice, but this is not the only one. There, there is at least another one, but this is the most popular one. So you could say, uh, why monotonicity in this story? Well, to explain to you why you have monotonicity, let me make a comparison. Let me make a comparison. Again, with a 1D, a one-dimensional forward-backward system of OD. So I would like to push further the comparison with one-dimensional forward-backward system. So here I gave you a quite generic forward-backward system, and then I claimed that you could find examples. But now I'm going to focus on something that is much more precise, much more explicit. So let me have a look at this system. X dot is minus YT and Y dot is a constant. And I'm sorry, and YT is G of XT. So this is an instance of a, of a forward backward system. So once again, X zero is prescribed. And in fact, this system is, is, at least formally, this is the system of characteristics of a Burgers equation. This is in dimension one. So formally, you may expect yt to be 
let me write this as capital U of T X T, right? And if you take the derivative in time, you have that Y dot is D T U plus D X U T X T. So maybe I'm going to remove the T X T times X dots. No, maybe this is too sloppy. Uh, I'm sorry, I should put T X T. So dxu txt uh, times x dot. Well, good point, but I know that this guy is equal to zero. This is my equation. <clears throat> and I know that x dot is minus yt. But minus yt by definition, if I have this formal definition, this is minus u txt. So at the end of the day, I should have that dtu minus dx u is equal is equal to zero and so this is the invincid invincid uh, burgers equation and for sure there are many results about burgers equation and we know where you have uniqueness to the characteristic system or um, when you have some shocks and I'm not going to write this down. I'm just going to, to use the slides I sent you this morning just to show you a few pictures, just to explain to you the reason why this is not a big surprise to have some monotonicity condition for midfield games because somehow this is a kind of infinite dimensional extension of what's going on for the Burgers equation. So let me just use my slides. So this is the one I sent you this morning. I decided to start with uniqueness wise. My slides start from existence, but this is the same. So this is exactly what I was just telling you. So you take the forward backward system. So the same as the one we have just seen. And you say, well, I have this, this, uh, this, this PD. And the point is that if you have the, the boundary condition G that is non-decreasing, then you have uniqueness to the characteristic system. And if not, then you may observe shocks appearing in finite time. And when I say shocks, it means that you will get a singularity certainly for the solution to the Burgos equation and you lose uniqueness of solution to the uh, to the forward backward system. Let me give you a, a picture for this phenomenon here. This is one choice for small g. So g, once again, this is the boundary condition. And here this is, you see the profile. Well, this is non-decreasing. And here on the right, these are the characteristics. You have to remember that time is going this way. So here, this is t is equal to one. And so this is fine. So here, this is the initial, these are some initial condition for, here, these are initial condition for x or for xt. And you see that you have uniqueness. There is no, the characteristics do not, uh, do not merge or, uh, I'm sorry, I should say there are no multiple solutions. This is what I should say. There are no multiple solutions. And now if you change the shape of the, uh, of the boundary condition, so you take this one, now you reverse. So you take the opposite. Um, then you get something that is not increasing. And now you see that if time is small, small enough with respect to the Lipschitz constant of small g, then you still have uniqueness. Whatever the initial point, you have a unique path in blue. But now when you increase time, and in fact, you reach the value of the Lipschitz constant of g, you see at this point that you have plenty of solutions, which is exactly what I said, what I was willing to mention a few minutes ago, if you run backwards your characteristic, 
then they merge. So you see that if you go this way, if you follow in the other direction, then the red characteristics are going to merge. Differently, if you start from the right direction, if you move forward, then you have multiple solutions. So you lose uniqueness if you lose here monotonicity. So in fact, you have the same phenomenon uh, for the um, for Minfield games. And maybe if, if you are really, really curious, you could say, well, so what's going to be the analog of this function new in the Minfield game setting? This is something that I'm going to speak about tomorrow, but not today. Uh, so the analog of this monotonicity condition. So here, the conclusion is that here we need monotonicity. So this is on the slide. So see the slides. So the question is, what would be, what would be the analog of monotonicity for Minfield games. Well, this is uh, the answer is given in the following uh, in the following way. So you have definition. We say that F and G satisfy the Las Reliance monotonicity condition if, so I'm going to write this down for F, but this would be the same for G. So you take two measures, arbitrary measures M, M prime. So these are elements of P of RD. And you say, well, I'm going to take f of x m minus f of x m prime. Right? So I make the differences or the difference between the two costs, and I integrate the difference with respect to the difference of the two measures. Well, implicitly, I require that uh, the integral makes sense. Uh, but if I assume f to be bounded as before, it makes sense for sure. And I want this to be non-negative. And the same for g. So here, this is for all m m prime. Well, you could wonder about an example for, uh, for such an f. And once again, I'm going to switch to the slides because this is a bit uh, a bit long to write down, but I'm going to show you an example for such an F, which is a typical example that people have been using. So let me go back to the same slides as before. So you see that, well, this is exactly our condition. This is the one that we have just described, except for the fact that you have mu and mu prime instead of m and m prime, but this is the same. Um, so you see that the example is, is this one. So, so let, me, let me try to explain to you the way it works. So you take L here. This is L for loss. This is a loss function. So this is a function that takes uh, all the times r into r. So the second argument is no longer a measure. This is really real. And you see that you require L to be non-decreasing in the second argument. So here you could say that in this variable, this is non-decreasing. It might be it might be flat. This is non-decreasing. Now you do as follow. You say, 
I'm going to take a smooth density rho. So rho here, this is a smooth density. So this is an even density. So this is a, a kernel that is non-negative. This is integral is equal to one. And here, this is even. And you say that when you check the state of the population that is given by, that is given by mu, and a point that is given by x, what you do is that you compute locally the mass that is embedded in mu in the neighborhood of x. So you see that in the integral you have in the right-hand side, you have x, but you take z in the neighborhood of x because you can assume that this density or this kind of row has a small let's say a small support around, uh, around zero to simplify. And Z is the variable with respect to which you take your integral. And now here, you really compute the local mass because you have the convolution of rho or mu by rho. So rho, rho star mu is, is, is a function. So this is computing the local mass that you have in u in the neighborhood of z, but z is very close to x. But so at the end of the day, what you do is that you compute uh, the local mass in, uh, in mu in the neighborhood of x. So now what, what, uh, what does it mean? It means that if mu is given and you want to pay a small price or a small cost, if you choose x, in the neighborhood of a region that is really dense for mu, then you will pay a high price. Because if X is close to a region that is with a high density for mu, it means that this quantity, this convolution is high if the local mass under mu is high in the neighborhood of x. So it means that if, uh, if, uh, if you want to have something that is lower, you have to go away from the others. So this is a quite understandable model. Uh, this is a phenomenon that you can see uh, in everyday life. I guess that when you enter any, any bus or any, any tramway, any metro, uh, any train, when you enter and there are many, many seats, but there are some people most of the time, and I should say all the time, you don't sit exactly in front or just near somebody else if there are many, many places. You, you go as far as possible from the others. This is something that is, I, I think, quite universal. I mean, and this is exactly what happens here. You don't want to be where the others are. So, so you, you want to be away from the others. And, and this phenomenon is going to restore uniqueness, in fact. This is what I'm saying. Um, okay, uh, give me, give me a minute. We, okay. Um, so this example, so uh, I, 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 once again, I, I explained to you the example on the side. So now the, the meta statements, so main statements, is that monotonicity forces uniqueness. Okay, so let me let me explain to you the way it works. Um, to simplify the proof, I'm going to make the proof. And uh, this is not so difficult. Uh, this is a bit painful because you have to be really, ca uh, really careful in the 
in the writing, but if I don't do this proof, I, I will do no proof basically. So let me assume that f is equal to zero. So f is equal to zero. And so you say, <clears throat> I assume with exactly the same model as before. And you say, I assume that, assume that I have two equilibria. Assume that there are two distinct equilibria. So uh, there is, let's say, mu t and mu t prime. In fact, when you have just g in the model, if I go back to the uh, to my problem, if you just have g and f is equal to zero, the only thing that you need in that case is mu at terminal time. You don't care about the shape of mu at the uh, in between. You just, you, in, in the backward equation, you just need mu at the terminal time. Anyway, this was just a remark. Um, because once you have mu at terminal time, you just need, you just, you, you're able to compute the HAB equation. So you can put this, in fact, mu t is n of or mu t prime. And so for with this mu and mu prime, you say with mu, uh, we associate u of mu. So this is the solution to the HAB equation. If we, with mu prime, we associate u of mu prime, which is the solution of the other HAB equation, but driven by mu prime. So the first one is for mu. Okay. So now what do we know? We know that these are equilibria. So by definition, we have that mu t is equal to the law of xt, where dxt is minus the gradient of ut mu t x t dt plus dbt. And we know that dx t prime is minus dx u mu prime t x t prime. So mu t prime is the law of x t prime dt plus dbt. And what I'm claiming is that we must have we must have that if I take the difference between the two strategies, so here there is a prime squared dt, and I take the expectation of this, it must be strictly positive. If this were equal to zero, then the two feedbacks would be almost everywhere the same. And so the lows would be the same. And since the lows would be the same, then there would be, this would be the same equilibria. So this is not possible by assumption. So what I'm claiming is that I have this that is strictly positive. So now I say, well, in the first, I have two cost functional. So then we consider the two cost functional. We consider J mu, or maybe let me use the same notation as the one I had yesterday. So J mu. So here, let me call this guy. Let me introduce a bit of notation as otherwise this will be too complicated for me. So here, let me call this guy alpha T prime with the minus. So this guy is alpha t prime, and this one is alpha t. So here this is minus alpha t, and here this is minus alpha t prime. And so I consider the cost to alpha in the environment mu. So I remember that the definition of this is E g of x t mu t. Since f is equal to zero, this is just one half of alpha t square dt. And since 
alpha is the minimizer by construction of the cost, this is strictly less than J of alpha prime and mu. Because there is a unique minimizer for the, for the optimal control problem. And now in the same way, we have G, J of alpha prime mu prime that is less than J of alpha mu prime. Maybe this is badly written. So what really matters is that if you're a bit lost here, this is the same environment, but these are not the same control. And here these are not the same control. And this is another value of the environment. So this is mu prime. And now you write exactly what it means for these two inequalities. So I say for the first one, this is exactly saying that E, so let me write this now, I have to be patient, mu t plus one half. And so you understand the reason why I cheated and I assume F to be zero, but this would be the same if there were F in my computation. I'm sorry, this is strictly less. E of G of X t prime, mu t plus one half alpha t prime squared dt. And you have the same for the second one, g x t prime mu t prime plus one half e alpha t prime squared dt strictly less than e of g of x t mu t prime plus one half alpha t squared dt. Okay, not very funny to write down anyway. And now you make the sum between the two things. You sum these two guys. What happens? This one is going to cancel with this one. And this one is going to cancel with this one, right? And so at the end of the day, what you have is that you have E of G X T mu T. So this is, this one is, let's say, sorry, this is this one. And now I subtract this one. So on the, um, no, maybe not, uh, not blue, this is not a good idea. Let me use yellow. So this one and this one. So minus G of X T mu T prime. Now I take uh, minus and I open a parenthesis. I take in green this one now. And so this is G of X T prime mu T minus the remaining one this one. So G of X T prime, mu T prime, and this is negative. And now you write exactly what is the meaning of this. If you take the first expectation, what is the law of X T? Well, that's mu T, very easy. So this is the integral over R D of G X mu T, minus g x mu t prime d mu t x. And you do the same for the other one. But now what is the law of x t prime? Well, this is mu t prime. g of x mu t prime minus g of, I'm sorry, the first one is mu t, sorry. g x mu t prime and then d mu t prime x. And now you have a minus. And so when you write the whole thing here, you get exactly the integral over R d of g x mu t minus g x mu t prime integrated with respect to the difference of the two measures. And we claim that this is negative, but this is not possible because by assumption, we have that G is non-decreasing. 
So there is a contradiction. So this is the way you get a uniqueness in this setting. And, and this is exactly the same when, when you have F in the uh, F in the in the cost. Okay, so this is something that is absolutely stand out in the field, and you have to know this on minfield games. So this was for uniqueness, and now I think that after the break, what we can do is to attack existence of a solution. So let me just give you what we are going or tell you what we are going to do next. So we will go back to this mapping phi. So I want you to remember for the rest of, the, of this paragraph, what is the meaning of this phi? So let me remind you of this and we will use that directly after the break. So this is the mapping that maps an input onto the law of the optimal feedback. We want a fixed point for this, but we are not allowed to use, we are not allowed to use a contraction argument because we know that it fails basically in most of the cases. So for the same phi as before, we want to use a fixed point theorem with, without uniqueness. And there are several of them, but what we are going to use is a topolo topological fixed point argument. And so this is shadow theorem that I'm going to use next. So please uh, keep in mind this capital phi for uh, uh, the, next, the next part of the lecture. And so I will explain to you not the whole detail, but part of it, of the way to implement Sharder theorem and then to get existence uh, under the setting that uh, that we have been uh, that we have been using. Okay, so I think this is a good time to stop. Uh, are there any questions on the on the chat? Uh, Francois, I, I would suggest that just as yesterday you put uh, some maybe this one. Uh, some slide for the while uh, taking a short poll, uh, anyone you want, uh, that will be freezing on uh, internet. Uh, great, okay. Okay, so we, it is uh, 11.29, so we resume at 11.35, this is okay? Great, perfect. Thank you. Okay. See you. Bye.
Okay, so welcome back. So we want to use uh, Schauder theorem for proving that there is um, a fixed point to this uh, function phi. So how to do this, maybe before uh, uh, I explain this to you, I should uh, recall you the shape of the Schader theorem. It says that you consider a mapping T that goes from C into itself. And C here is a closed convex subset of some normed 
vector space. And you want this mapping T to be continuous. Okay. And such that T of C is relatively compact. So this is E is the vector space, so relatively compact in E. Then T has a fixed point. Well, the question when you have this is uh, how to apply this statement to our problem. So what is E, what is C, and what is T? Well, it's not pretty difficult to guess that we are going to choose phi as being T itself, or T as being phi. But now this is more subtle for E and C. In fact, if you have a look at the statement, you need a structure of vector space, which means that um, this is much larger than the space of probability measures, which is convex, but which is not linear. So you can find this in the book with Rene, volume one, chapter four, I think. So Carmona de la Rue, volume one, chapter four. And so what you will see is um, that we can choose E as the space. So this is the space of measures, not probability measures, finite signed measures, um, for which the you can compute or you can associate or you can integrate uh, the the norm the norm in RD. So let's say that this is the collection of all the new finite signed measures. on RD such that the integral over RD of the absolute value of X integrated with and uh, absolute new is finite, right? Uh, uh, and once you, I'm sorry. Once you have this, you have to equip this with, with a norm. And you say that as a norm, you are going to compute the total mass of the space. And then you take something that might look a bit complicated at first sight. So you take all the test function, which are one Lipschitz continuous, such that L0 is equal to zero of the absolute value of the difference L X. So this is D new X. Yeah. Well, it looks to be a complicated choice and maybe uh, you could say why. The very, very good point is that there is a result which is known as Kontorovich Rubinstein duality. So you can find this. Uh, I'm sorry. You can find this uh, this uh, this kind of things in uh, in the book of Villani, for instance. Uh, that says that <clears throat> if you take mu and mu prime, two probability measures.
on RD such that you can integrate the absolute value under mu and mu prime. Then you have that the norm mu minus mu prime is in fact the W1 distance between mu and mu prime. So W1 is exactly the one that we had yesterday. So in fact, this is really, really useful because it says that uh, when we use this norm, in fact, restricted to the space of probability measures, then we know exactly what is its behavior. And this is something that we know, this is the W1 distance. Okay. Um, back to my program. Now I'm going to choose C as being T, uh, C as being P1. So what is C? What is C? I'm going to say that C is P1 of RD. Well, here you could say, well, that's really strange what we are doing because we don't see time. So I should say that in the example that I'm going to solve here, I'm doing exactly the same thing as in the proof of uniqueness. I'm just going to focus here on the case when G is equal to zero, uh, F is equal to zero, sorry. F is equal to zero. So keep in mind that this is the same proof. I will tell you how to generalize quite quickly next, but I won't, don't want to make it too difficult. So when F is equal to zero, so in fact, C is P1. And now I have my mapping phi. So the application is, in fact, since F is equal to zero, I told you before that this was enough to have a look at the state of the population at terminal time. So we take mu in p1, okay, then we solve, we solve exactly the HAB equation, so dt u mu plus one half delta u mu minus one half the gradient u mu squared is equal to zero because f is equal to zero, and u mu t dot is g mu. So there is no need to specify t because I completely cheated it to simplify. And then we map this onto dx t, or maybe I should say the law of x t, the law of x capital T, with dxt as being minus dxu mu txt tdt plus dbt. Okay. And so we have C and for sure C is closed and convex. And so the only difficulty is that we need to prove that this mapping is continuous. Okay. And that this is relatively, or the range is relatively compact. Okay, let me speak about continuity first and give you some intuition about the way it works. So continuity. So in fact, you can take Maybe I should put a mu here just to clarify things. So I should put mu here, here, and here. So you take mu and mu prime two inputs. Now this is really easy. These are just measures and there is no longer time in my story. And what I do is that I want to compare in the W1 sense, the law of X T mu with the law of X T mu prime. 
But I told you yesterday how to do this. I just have to compare the L1 distance between the random variables. But I know what is the dynamics of these two variables. This is exactly given by this stochastic differential equation. The noises are the same. So the only thing that I have to compare here is I need to compare uh, dxu mu or the drift, if you prefer. So, well, what to say? We could say if we have a bound, let's say that we have a bound for the second order derivatives of u of mu, which is let's say reasonable if um, uh, this is reasonable if uh, if we have enough smoothness on, on G, for instance, then to control this at the end of the day, what we have to do is to compare dx u mu and dx mu u prime precisely in fact if you really want to go to the computation then you will see that it's going to be less than dx u mu txt minus dx mu prime txt mu prime dt okay and so now you could say well uh, how to compare this uh, how to compare these things. And really at the end of the day, this is exactly comparing dx mu and dx mu prime. The way, the way it works, this is, there is a nice computation that you can do. You can compute, if you know, if you like stochastic calculus, you can compute d of dx u mu txt mu so here, this D is the same as, we, as the one we had yesterday. This is a small increment. And if you expand this by Eto's formula, if you expand this by Eto's formula, what you will find is that this is, well, in this situation, precisely in the case that we have since F is equal to zero, this is a martingale. So for those of you who know stochastic calculus here, this will be the second order derivatives acting on dBT. And the same for the same for the other one. This is just, you take the derivative in your AJB equation and then you apply it to formula and you will find this. And so at the end of the day, what you have is that when you want to compare, if you want to compare dx u mu t x t mu minus dx u mu prime t x t mu prime, since you have here, this is martingales or stochastic integrals, you would say that this is just less than the terminal, the terminal values. So x t mu mu t minus d x g x t mu prime. So here there is no t, and here this is. I'm sorry. This is mu prime. Okay. Well, so in fact, when you do this, when you do this, you see that you want to compare, when you want to compare the quantity that you have here, this one, You are exactly, if you do the computation in this way, you get this inequality. 
But this is not so interesting to do that because if you do that, at the end of the day, you still have to compare XT mu and XT mu prime. So a way to cheat is to say that, in fact, I have directly to compare DX mu and DX mu prime by using a bound on the second order derivatives. So this is just to tell you that when I'm back to the comparison of the two forward equations or the equation for with associated with mu and the equation associated with mu prime, what I'm going to use is that I prefer to use instead. So here we have again to compare xt mu and xt mu prime. And so instead, we compare or we say that if you are back to the forward equation, so the difference between the mu's, you say that the xt mu, xt mu prime is equal as we did before to dx u mu t x t mu minus dx u mu prime t x t mu prime dt. And what I'm going to say is that this is less than dx u minus dx u mu prime infinite plus a constant times xt mu minus xt mu prime. So a way to do so is to claim that, right, I have this and then, and in the constant C here, for sure, I should see, I should see C depends on the second order derivatives for u. But once again, if, if g is sufficiently, uh, if g is sufficiently uh, uh, smooth, then this is fine to have this, uh, this bound. And so at the end of the day, this is what I was telling you. Um, we have to compare these two quantities and this is the one that you have, you have here. So this is now a PD result that you can use to say that if mu converges to mu or mu n converges to mu, then you have that the distance between the gradients uh, here, this is in L infinity is going to turn to zero. So prove that if W1 mu n mu tends to zero, then you have that dx u mu n minus dx u mu infinity tend to zero. And this is the way you will get, uh, you will get a continuity. So now this is a mainly equation of uh, regularity of the HJB equation with respect to a parameter. Okay, so here this is for continuity. This is uh, what we should do. Uh, so now this is a question of continuity uh, of the solution of the PDE was with respect to a parameter. I'm not going to discuss this in, uh, in detail. Uh, I think better for you to, to have a look at the references that I gave you. What about the range? The fact that the range is relatively compact so compactness or relative compactness of the range. Well, uh, if you go back to, to, to the picture for phi, then you, you have to see what is the, the output. So the output in our mapping is the law of xt mu. And in fact, I told you that x t mu was equal to x zero minus the integral from zero to t of dx u mu 
txt mu dt plus bt. And this x0 follows the initial state of the population. So the law of x0 is exactly mu0. And now you have to keep in mind, and this is something that I told you, that this guy is less than a constant. So in fact, this is pretty easy to say that E x t mu squared is less than a constant, at least if x zero is square integrable. So I remind you that this is for sure x squared mu zero x. And so it turns out that this says, if you have this, this implies that the output, so the law of x t mu, so this has a finite second moment. But now there is a result about Wasserstein spaces that says that the collection of measures for which the second moment is bounded by a constancy, this is a compact subset in W1. So result, you can see that, or you can find this result in the book of Villani. If you take a collection mu of probability measures in P1, such that x squared d mu x is less than C, then this is relatively compact. In P1 equipped with W1. So this is the, the way you get relative compactness. Okay, so this is basically the way Schader theorem can be applied here. So now you could have this question, what happens when F is not equal to zero? So now this is a bit more difficult because you can no longer work only with the terminal state of the population. And now you have to regard E as being the space of continuous function from zero T into, so maybe this one that I used before. So the one that we had in the first part of the lecture. So this E, let me call this let me give a name to this. Let me call this the space of finite measures. Or let me say M1, M1 because, yeah, let me say, let me call this M1 of RD. This is the name I, I, I put. And so you have now, M1 was just a space of measures when, F is not equal to zero, then the inputs of your mapping phi are really, really path with values in the space of probability measures. And accordingly, the space that you have to take for the, for the fixed point, for the shadow theorem is this one. And so you could wonder about what is C. So for C, you could say, oh, so, okay, maybe, to avoid confusion. So here, this is continuous. So let me see, let me call this C0. C0 mappings. And C is going to be C0 mappings from 0t into P1 of Rd. Okay. And then you have to prove once again, continuity of the mapping phi from E to, from C into itself. But this is the same as before. This is mostly a question of, uh, of continuity of the PD with respect to a parameter. And for relative compactness, for relative compactness, this is exactly what you did here. So this is same thing as when F is equal to zero, meaning that what you prove is that the supremum in time of all the second moments of the law of the output, but now you need to do that at any time is finite. 
So this is not enough for relative compactness because you want relative compactness in the space of continuous function. And so you use the fact that you have some equicontinuity, which was the one I mentioned before. If you compute W1 of the law of XT mu underline, the law of XS mu underline, then this is less than CT minus S to the one half. So for S less than T, less than capital T. So I'm a bit quick here. This is just to say that if you want to generalize really to the, to the setting that we had before, you need to pay attention to the notion of relative compactness. And here you need to include time in the analysis. And in order to include time in the analysis, you need to prove that the bounds that you have for the second moment is uniform in time. And you need some equicontinuity or some uniform continuity in time. But this is something that we discussed before. I told you before about this, this bound. So this was in the first part of the lecture today. OK. So this is what I wanted to, to say about Schader theorem. If, if you want to have more details, because I was a bit, maybe a bit quick, but I have to, to make some choices. Then once again, you can see uh, the chapter four in the, in the book, uh, volume one with, uh, with Carmona. Uh, this, is, uh, this is detailed. OK, this was for section one. Now what about uh, section two and what I wanted to, to discuss further after the solvability? So other approaches. In fact, what we have been doing, and this was my choice, uh, this was to, to make um, or to provide the approach based on PD system. But in fact, it turns out that there are other approaches uh, for solving minfield games, which are more based, I would say, on the probabilistic arguments. Um, I would say that this is mostly a, a, a matter of taste and depending on the type of problems that you have, maybe the PD method would be more suitable or, or conversely. So I cannot really say that one approach is better than the other one. It mostly depends on, 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 the, on the model that you have or your own feelings or your own skills. Uh, but let's say that I would like to give, to give a few words on, on other approaches. Um, so the first thing I would like to, to say is that we can reformulate reformulation of the main field game system, which is the forward backward system I had, as a Mackin Vlasov forward backward stochastic differential equation. So SDE now, this is for stochastic differential equation. I will be quite quick here. What I want to say is that. When you have the PD approach, you freeze where you are in time and space, and then you compute the cost you have to pay. In the probabilistic formulation, as I'm going to tell you about, you follow the evolution of the cost along the optimal trajectory. So let me just do, set my battery. Um, so the, the, the strategy, the strategy is, I would say, you take the MFG system, as I told you about. You take the MFG system. So you know that the optimal trajectory in environment mu underline is equal to mu t. This is dxt is equal to minus dxu mu underline txt dt plus dbt. So these are things that we have seen. But now what you can do is you can say, I'm going to let yt 
as being the cost or the remaining cost that I have to pay when I follow the trajectory. So this is really, you follow the cost that you have to pay till the end. And then you expand, you expand dyt by Ito's formula. And so when you uh, expand dyt by Ito's formula, what you get is that dyt is going to be dt u mu underline txt. You will get one half the Laplace for the Brenner motion. And then you have minus the inner product of the gradient with respect to itself. So this is dt. And then you have a stochastic integration that comes from the fact that you have some run motion in the dynamics. So this is the equation you have. So here, once again, you really follow the cost that you have to pay till the end of time. And now you use the PD. You use the PD for this quantity. And if you use the PD, if you use the PD, what you obtain is precisely that this is, when you replace by the PD, this is just a standard algebra, you will have F of XT mu T, so mu is the environment, plus one half DXU mu underline TXT squared DT plus TXU mu underline TXT dBT. And so what people from probability theory do, and there are many people in Marrakesh that, that know very well these kind of things, is to say that you call this quantity as being ZT. And you have the following equation for YT, which is, a, which is called a backward stochastic differential equation. And you get that dyt is minus f xt mu t, I'm sorry, plus one half zt squared dt plus zt dbt. And so this is coupled with the boundary condition that yt has to be equal to g of x t mu t. So this is the terminal cost or the cost that you pay at terminal time. So once again, this is a backward stochastic differential equation. And so the theory for this kind of equation goes back to the works of Peng and Pardoux in the nineties. So for those of you who know the field, uh, they, they won't learn anything new in what I'm going to say now, but for those of you who do not know this, uh, these types of equation or this type of equations, it seems a bit strange at first sight to have one equation, but two unknowns, because somehow you have two unknowns. Uh, from the PD point of view, this corresponds to uh, the value function and the gradient of the value function. And in fact, the whole thing comes from the fact that the boundary condition for this equation is at terminal time. So this is boundary time or boundary condition at terminal time. But basically the solution that you want is the cost that you have to pay or the optimal cost you have to pay at time T when you are in stage or in location or in state X small t. So the, the remaining cost that you have to pay is something that is non-anticipative. This is exactly the same thing as the one I told you yesterday. You don't anticipate on the future of the equation. 
And so it says that here, yt has to be sigma of x0 and the Brunner motion s less than t measurable. So you don't want to see the future after t of the Brunner motion. And somehow what the Martingale terms does in this, in this equation, this is a Martingale, which means this is not exactly correct, but think of this, that the expectation of this is, 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 is a constant. Um, and so the impact of the Martingale term is to penalize the solution so that it is precisely non-anticipative. If you remove the blue term, if you remove this, and if you say, I hide this term, then you see that this is, and I had this, uh, so the meaning of this one is not completely clear anyway, but you see that you will pay the stochasticity or you will pay for the stochasticity of the terminal boundary condition. And you will see certainly the fact that the boundary condition sees the whole trajectory of the Brunner motion. So the term Z the backward in the backward equation is here to penalize the solution and to force the solution to be non-anticipative. And in fact, what I'm saying is not only for Y, but also for Z. So this is uh, the point in the backward SD formulation. And so now what you say is that when you solve the fixed point problem, When you solve the fixed point problem, then you have to identify mu t with the law of x t itself. So <clears throat> it means that you take your forward equation, but the forward equation is this one you have here on the middle of the page. But what is dxu? dxu is precisely z. So you end up with a forward-backward system of the Mackinders of type. And so you have that dxt is minus zt dt plus dbt and dyt is minus ft, I'm sorry, xt, the law of xt, plus one half zt squared dt plus zt dbt. And then y capital T is g of xt, the law of xt. And we call this mackin vlasov precisely because, so mkv for me means mackin vlasov because you have the law of the solution inside the coefficients. You could wonder about the solvability of this equation. Basically, you will get similar results as the one for the PD. So the results, solvability results are the same and, and the proof is really, really similar. There, there are no, no big differences. So you assume FG bounded, let's say, uh, bounded derivatives. uniformly in the measure argument. You need also F and G as before to be continuous, uh, continuous in the, in the measure argument. So I don't remember exactly how far this has to be uh, precise. Uh, certainly, uh, if you want my proof to, to work, the previous one uniformly continuous is needed. So let's say that this is Lipschitz in the measure argument. And uh, for the previous proof, uh, it could be with respect to, uh, I think W2 is, is, uh, is fine, but you could say with respect to W1, for instance, uh, this would be even stronger, but th this would be clearly enough. Uh, and then, uh, and then this is this is what you need.
So this is exactly the same type of, uh, of conditions. And so once again, I refer to the book with Carmona, chapter four, volume one, you will, you will find the details for the, the type of assumptions that we need, but this is exactly the same strategy as being based on the, on the Schauder theorem. There is no, no main conceptual differences between the two approaches. Once you have understood that they are connected by the, by, by the, by the HAB equation that is behind. Okay. So this was for the uh, for the FBE system. Here, this is an FBSD system for the for the cost. What you represent in this system is really the cost. And so the cost is you see the cost exactly here. You follow the optimal cost that you have to pay when the environment is uh, is frozen. Another possibility uh, is to write a new mackin vlasov FBSD, FBSD system, but for, for the optimal feedback. Well, I, I don't have time enough to, to write this, uh, this down properly, but in fact, this is connected with the Pontryagin principle. If you remember well, what we did in, uh, or what we want to do in, uh, in infinite games is to say first, when I have, when I am given the, uh, uh, the environment, I have to give or to say what is the optimal trajectory. One way is to use the HAB equation or this FBSD for the value or for the optimal cost. Another way is to write down the Pontryagin principle. Um, so the Pontryagin principle, this is just, in fact, this is just a, a necessary condition for the optimizer or for the optimal state. Okay, uh, so the fact that this is a necessary condition, you could say that it's a bit, uh, it's a bit a problem because you may lose uh, some, uh, some characterization, but in fact, the very good point, and this is what I'm going to say is just a, a kind of meta remark, a bit philosophical remark, but the Pontryagin principle has the great advantage of being really, really robust. And when, uh, in some main field games, you, you randomize the state of the population. Maybe I will have time to speak about this a little bit on Thursday. When you randomize the state of the population, it turns out that uh, writing an HJB equation is more and more difficult because the HJB equation becomes stochastic. And in comparison, writing the Pontryagin principle is much, much easier. And so this is really robust and the randomization of the environment. This is what you have to keep in mind. So this is robust and the randomization. Of the environment. Okay. Here, I'm not going to give you the whole theory for the Pontryagin principle. So really, it goes back to the works of, uh, of Peng. I'm sure that uh, students from Marrakesh, uh, they, they know these kind of things. Um, so what I'm going to do is to tell you how to get this intuitively, starting from the MFG system. I don't want to leave my MFG system. This is my, uh, uh, my red line today. And uh, I, I want to get stick to it. So. What I'm going to do is to tell you how to do that. And so uh, here we obtain the system by returning to the HJB equation. And so what you do is to say, I'm going to compute the derivative of the HJB equation, which is basically my optimal feedback in my, uh, in my settings. So 
Now, instead of following the optimal cost, which is what I was doing in the previous explanation here in blue, this was uh, in the blue box, this was the optimal cost. Now what I'm going to do is to follow the optimal feedback somehow. So up to the sign, this is the optimal feedback. So now this is another shape, another choice. So I'm doing this. So we follow the optimal feedback. And so this is the computation that I have just mentioned and I told you about uh, a, few, a few lines ago. I was a bit quick on this. This was just to show you the need for having the second order derivatives in this computation. No, this is not this one. This was, uh, this was here. Yeah, this was this one. When, G, when F is equal to zero, uh, I had this computation. Now F is no longer equal to zero, so you have to be a little bit careful, but this is again straightforward computation. So there is nothing really difficult here. You get that DYT, in this situation, I'm not going to make the whole computation. This is minus dxf xt mu t dt plus, well, uh, these were in my previous computation. These were the second order derivatives of u mu underline xt mu underline dbt. So here I, I should tell you that this guy is a, is a matrix, this guy is a vector. So this is really a, a, a product of a matrix times a vector. Previously here, this was, uh, maybe I was a bit quick. This was really an inner product. This one was an inner product because the result is a cost and has to be regarded as an element of, uh, of R. So you have this, uh, this equation for y, and, and what you say is that at the same time, you know that dx t mu underline is minus the optimal, or the optimal feedback, which is minus the gradient. And this guy is y. And so you cap all the two things as before. And so you say, if mu t is the low of x t, we must have the, following system, xt is minus yt dbt, dyt is minus dxf xt mu t, which is now the law of xt, dt, zt, dbt, and yt is g of xt, the law of xt. And so you can solve this system to find the equilibria. Um, what I can explain to you now is just a bit of example that you can find in the literature. So there are many, many, many results about the linear quadratic case. And many of them have been using or used, I should say used uh, this, uh, this Pontryagin formulation uh, because it leads to a forward backward system of the linear type and we know how to solve this quite easily under some nice assumption uh, by using some Riccati equations. So uh, I think that I have a few slides about this. Uh, let me go back to what I had. So this is yesterday. <clears throat> uh, the lecture of yesterday that was not completely uh, so here, this is exactly what I told you about this, this formulation. So you will find this in the slides if you want to re uh, recap. I thought that I included, yes, exactly. This is, this is a typical situation that, that you can have. So this is an example of, uh, of a mean field game that you can find in, in practice. So you see that this is a, even more complicated because the shape of the drift in the forward equation on my slides are a little bit more complicated. So here it means that dxt, dxt is 80xt plus 80 prime 
so this is the mean. So this is a bad notation, but I think that for my slide, this was very convenient to do this. This is really the mean of mu. And then you have bt alpha t plus dbt. And here this is times dt. Uh, so in, in, our, in our setting, if, if you want to get stick or to, 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 to follow our setting, then we don't have these two terms. In fact, we just have, and we have B as being the identity. So we just have alpha. More interestingly, regarding what we have been doing is that you see that we call this linear quadratic because uh, you see the quadraticity now in the shape of the two uh, running and terminal cost. And what you do is that this is quadratic in X and also in the measure. In fact, you could relax a little bit the shape of the mean field interaction, but this is something that is really, really common in, in the MFG literature as a kind of example. And so I should certainly say that if you go back to the earlier papers of Keynes, Malame, and Wong, the one that I quoted yesterday, and uh, some, some other papers, then they have many, many examples of this type. The reason is that you can almost compute things explicitly. So this is the interest of having linear quadratic example. And also you have some examples by I think there was a cut in the slide. Yeah, so I have to reconnect. Um, okay, let me reconnect my pad. Sorry about this. So there was a cut on my uh, tablet. Um, so, I should we connect? Uh, yes, yeah, so the Wi Fi on my tablet has been disconnected. I don't know why. So now, okay, I just have to pay attention to the sound. Okay, so I think that this is okay. Good, really good. Okay, so, so once again, what I was saying is that this kind of model is really useful because the solutions are, are more or less explicit. So now what people do, what people do is that instead of using the, the HJB system plus Fokker Planck uh, um, plus HJB system, they use Pantry again, exactly as I, as I told you. So you can do the computation as an exercise. I'm not going to, going to write this down. This is just replacing uh, the coefficients, but then you will, uh, you will find this shape for the Pantry again. So keep in mind that in my own formulation, A was equal to zero. So there is not this term, not this term. Basically, B is equal to one. And you don't have this term neither. And so you have this kind of, of forward backward system. And so this is completely explicit, which is the really, really nice point. And so what you do in order to solve the equation, so completely independently of any Schauder theorem, so you forget for Schauder, and you say, I'm sorry, you say, I take the mean. So, which is uh, the good point to, to do in this kind of, uh, of things. So you take the mean and then you realize that for sure, when you take the mean, you get a new forward backward system, but for the mean. So you see that somehow you completely reduce the dimension of the analysis. So this is no longer an infinite dimensional system. This is just a mirror system uh, in, in dimension one. And now you need to find some sufficient conditions under which 
you have existence and possibly uniqueness to this uh, to this system. And so here, what I tell you is that uh, you have this condition Q times Q plus Q prime. So this is related to the shape of the coefficients you have in G uh, and the same for M and M prime uh, positive. And then you have, you have uh, existence and uniqueness of a solution. I think that the, you can do this as an exercise. I don't have time to do this. This is not that difficult. This is just solving a Riketty equation. Maybe the, the answer is given in the, is the answer given? Yes, maybe. So this was the answer in this. No, there is no answer in the. Oh no, I told you the, the way to prove that this was well posed. Yes, the argument is to say that when you have, in fact, when you have a forward backward system of this type, exactly as the one you have here at the bottom of the slides, you can regard this as the pantry again system of a completely standard optimization problem. And so here you recognize the two coefficients that I was mentioning. So this one and this one. And if they are non-negative, it means that the, the functional are convex in X and alpha. And in that case, there must be uniqueness. This is strictly convex in alpha plus convex in X. And so there must be existence and uniqueness of a minimizer, hence unique solvability of the, of the Pontryagin system. So this is the reason why it works. And you have that under uh, the sign condition, you have the fact that you have uniqueness to the, uh, to the min field system. Um, so you have the solution in fact in the slide. So I, I was a bit quick, but I don't think that this is, uh, this is really difficult. Uh, if you want to, 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 to do this as an exercise, I think you can do that. Okay. So this was, uh, this was the example I wanted to, to, to explain to you. So just to, to finish with, so I would like to, to, to conclude. So I won't have time to, to address uh, um, mean field control, uh, not today at least. So uh, just to conclude this, uh, these two lectures, I would like to show you uh, how to get back to the original model, because at the end of the day, this is where we, we started from yesterday. And this is a reasonable question for you to say, well, but why does it make sense to do all this, uh, all this story? And, uh, uh, how can I, can, can I use this in, in, in practice? So uh, this is the, the, last, uh, the last part of this, of this discussion today. Um, so three, back to the... and play your game. Um, so back to the end player game. So somehow you want to say how, how consistent is the solution that you have found with the original game. So is the solution that or I should say a solution that we have constructed meaningful for the original finite game. So when I say finite game, it means that I have in mind uh, the game with finitely many players. So here you, you could say, well, in fact, to solve this equation, there are two ways. And, and you have to be aware of this fact. In, in main field game theory, these are two relevant equations. So now this is more conceptual equations uh, rather than uh, doing uh, uh, computations. So, so the two equations that you have are the following two ones. One first way is to say, I'm going to solve the game with finitely many players and I'm going to see whether the limits in any sense solve the midfield game. So this is the first way. So you solve the finite 
game and you let n tend to infinity and prove that equilibria converge to a solution of the minfield game. So once again, you come back, you go back to the problem that we had yesterday. You solve this. You solve this. In some way, I will tell you this uh, about this in the next lectures. And you try to pass to the limit and prove that the solution solve the original minfield game. Somehow this is the hard way. Really, really, uh, this is exactly what you should call the north face if you wanted to climb up on the hill. So really this is the north face or the hard way, call this as you want. Uh, and so th this has been a, a, a quite, uh, this has been a, an open problem in, in the field. And I will tell you uh, tomorrow or Thursday, I don't know, uh, a possible strategy to solve this. So now we know how to solve this question, but it was not completely clear uh, during the first years of the of the field, how to solve this question. So the easy way the easy way is to do the converse. You start from the solution of the minfield game, and you say, I don't care about having. Uh, the equilibria of the original minfield game and proving that they converge, or the, uh, the equilibria of the original finite game and proving that they converge. I don't care because this is so complex to compute an equilibrium that in fact, for, for a game with, uh, with many, many players, that in fact, I'm not able to compute this one. So what I'm going to do is to solve numerically the minfield game and I'm going to use the solution of the minfield game and to play this strategy as being given by the minfield game into the game with finitely many players. And maybe this won't be exactly an equilibrium, but this should not be far so far from being an equilibrium. And so this is the second way. So use the equilibrium feedback of the minfield game as a strategy or as a feedback strategy or as a feedback function in the original game. It makes sense. And this is what I'm going to explain to you, certainly since I'm a bit out of time, I will use the slides. But you have to be aware of the fact that to do this, you have to solve numerically the minfield game. Now you could, you could argue and you could say, but why should solving the minfield game numerically be easier or less complex than solving the original game? Well, precisely because when you solve the minfield game, you use all the decorrelation effects or all the decorrelation properties of the law of large numbers. And so somehow you just see the environment that is described statistically and the state of one type particle. Whilst in the original game, you have somehow to follow all the players. So it makes sense to say that it might be possible that solving the minfield game is less complex because you really, really benefit from all the averaging properties, the correlation effects that we that we mentioned yesterday. Okay, back to the to the question. So let me explain this to you on the slides. I'm a bit uh, out of time, and maybe this would be easier to do that. So here, these are things that we have discussed. So you will. If you go back to the slides, you will find exactly things that I discussed 
Um, so here we have been doing this. So here I did that as well. So here, this is what I wanted to speak about, but I was too slow as, as usual. Um, okay, back to finite games. Oh, you see that, I'm sorry for the, for the numbering, I merged several slides and uh, this, is, uh, this is not completely clean. If I have time, I will change this anyway. So you go back to the original game. So, so forget about this eta. So once again, this is because I merged a bit quickly uh, some slides. So forget about this, this, uh, this, this term. And so this is really the, the problem that we had yesterday. And so you would like the connection between this original game and our main field game. Okay. As I told you, the north face you solve the Nash equilibria of the game with n players, and you try to do that or to let it uh, to pass to the limit. In fact, the difficulty for those of you who want to know the story is that the feedback functions are going to be defined in larger and larger spaces. And so having some compactness is almost hopeless. So you have to cheat. Either you use re really weak topology, which is one way, or you do something else. And I will speak about something else tomorrow or Thursday. So let me now discuss this, uh, what I told you about, which is the easy way. What you want to do is to use the solution of the Minfield game uh, to, get, uh, to get a solution or an early equilibrium or an approximate equilibrium for the original game. Uh, so this is uh, this will be my last uh, my last uh, slide I think today. So what you do is that so the very good point of this story is that you don't care about uniqueness. It seems to be strange, but no, you don't care about uniqueness. You don't want to identify the limit of something. You just want to use something that you have constructed. So you can take any solution you want as being given by the shadow fixed point theorem. So without uniqueness. Or if you have any numerical method, you take any, uh, uh, any solution that is given. If, even though you don't know exactly which one is selected, you can take any one that is given by your method. And so you say mu. So here, this is mu bold. Uh, this is my underlying mu. So this is the whole path mu t as we had before. In this u of mu is really the solution to the HAB equation. And stem story, this guy is my feedback up to the sign. This is my feedback function. And so precisely this is what I'm saying here. The feedback is, is this one. So now I guess that you know this. Well, I told you uh, uh, before that it makes sense to assume that I have some Lipschitz property on this uh, on this x. This is something that we discussed. Okay, and now you say, well, if I am back to the particle system, so here you have to be aware of the fact that I is a label of or the label of a particle. So this is between one and capital M. I am requiring that all my players play this as a strategy. And now you see exactly why minfield games beside the mathematical equations have become so popular from the practical point of view. And in fact, the guys I mentioned yesterday, those people from Canada, they, they really come from engineering because you see that the solution is absolutely simple. Assume that you have been able to get a solution from the numerical point of view to the, your uh, MFG system, you get the solution of the backward equation of the, of the HJB equation. And when you plug the optimal feedback, this is just a function of XI itself. So if you are the driver in the roundabout and you have pre-computed uh, the solution to the HJB equation at equilibrium, then it means that to apply it in practice, it means that you just have to know where you are. You don't care about the others because somehow this is pre-computed 
in the HJB equation. This is pre-computed in the shape of U mu. This is what we call in practice having decentralized control because this is completely decentralized in the sense that there is no absolutely no need to do or to see what the others do, what the others are doing. Really, that's from the complexity point of view, this is really a substantial improvement. You just have to see where you are. And you assume that the others are playing the same feedback, but they implement the same feedback function at their own states. So this will be xi for another value of i and so for another value of xi. So this is the last line you have at the bottom of the slide. You assume that you can pre-compute this guy. And if you want to have a look at numerical methods, which is another story, certainly the leader, the leader uh, person in this, uh, in this uh, equation is uh, Yves Ajdou in Paris uh, Diderot, who did a lot uh, also with uh, his former uh, PhD student, uh, Mathieu Laurier, uh, uh, they did a lot in, uh, in, uh, in the investigation of numerical methods. And you can find in the Chime lecture notes that I mentioned to you yesterday, the one in the lecture notes in mathematics, so on Minfield Games, so lecture notes in maths 2020, uh, they, they, wrote, they, they wrote a survey about numerical aspects of Minfield Games. And, and I had a look, this is really nice. And I really encourage you to have a look at this. Um, so you compute the, you pre-compute this. And what you do next is to say, well, now this is, this is pretty easy. This is just a simple particle system. And, and, and in fact, there is nothing to do to prove here in the sense that the particles are independent because they play the same feedback function, which only depends on their own state. So they are independent and they have the same distribution. And so in fact, when I have this convergence here, this is even more than a convergence. I should say that the law of this is directly equal to the tensor product of the law of the solution to the equation. I think that originally I formulated this slide just to be reminiscent of propagation of chaos, but this is even stronger here because you really see that here the particles, if you play this feedback strategies, they are independent. And in fact, they are IID, provided that the initial conditions are IID themselves. Well, that's, that's the point. And now, since you have this, in fact, what you can prove is that the empirical measure, which you have at the bottom of the slide, so this is the empirical measure as we saw yesterday. Since the particles are IID, the empirical measure is going to converge to the theoretical measure. And the theoretical measure mu t is exactly the law of xt star, which is the low mu t of my main field game. This is the same. So I know that the empirical measure by the law of lar large number is going to converge. Okay, you will say, and so, so what? What is the connection with the game? This could be your, your, your equation. So what you can prove when you do so is that, so this is, in fact, this is the main result that you can find. And this is something that, I think this was one of my first uh, paper with Rene on the field, uh, but you can find this in, uh, I should say that uh, Lyons, Lassie and Lyons wrote similar things uh, in, in the very first articles and Kens, Madame and Wang as well. But this formulation is really taken from my first paper with Rene. And uh, you can find uh, more about this in, the, in the chapter six, volume two of the book with Rene. But once again, I should say that uh, this DRD was not new. Uh, this, is, uh, this was given already by, uh, by, the, by the fathers of the topic. Uh, anyway, so here's a summary of, of the result that you will find in the literature. You say, 
I require, so I ask my players to play this decentralized control. I call JSTAR the cost in the MFG settings. So here, this is the optimal cost in the environment muti. And the first result, which is absolutely straightforward, you have, you have the solution that is given here if you want, uh, is that the limit of the cost, the cost in the end particle system is going to converge towards the MFG cost. The reason is that you just have the convergence of the empirical measure as given by this uh, bottom line on the slide. And so since the cost in the, in the end particle system depends on the empirical distribution, it's going to converge to the cost with the theoretical distribution, hence the convergence of this J towards J star. Now you say, but this is not a Nash property. So how to do a Nash property? And this is formulated in this, in this manner. You say now, I'm going to check that this is almost a Nash. So this is what we call here an, appro an approximate or a quasi-Nash equilibrium, maybe approximate is a little bit better. You take one particle in the system. Let's say particle number one. Everybody is, uh, is, is the same from the statistical point of view. So I, I could take any other index, this would be the same. So I'm saying I take player number one and I assume that this guy is willing to change its own strategy. And it changes into beta one. But exactly as in the definition of a Nash, as we did yesterday, I assume that the others freeze their strategies. To simplify here, I'm working with open loop. We could discuss whether this is possible to do the same in closed loop, but just say this is an open loop. Then the result is that if the energy that I use is too large, so the energy of my control is too large, then there will be a macroscopic deviation. And so clearly, I will be completely outside any optimality. So this is not interesting for me to deviate with a very, very large energy. So this is something I don't want to do. It costs me a lot at the end of the day. So now if I just use, I'm just using a finite or bounded, I should say, bounded energy, then what happens is that when I deviate, so here you see that I am deviating for a, a new control or a new, uh, yes, a new control with a finite energy. So the others are playing the original strategy as being given by the solution of the MFG. And so indeed, what I have is this lower bound. And what it says is that this lower bound could be, it could be less than the best that what I have, the cost I have at the optimum under the MFG. So in other words, if you want to close the loop, you say, I could have that the new cost after the deviation, it could be a little bit below J star. And so a little bit below the cost before the deviation. But if this is below, the gain is really, really small. This is epsilon n that tends to zero when n tends to infinity. And in fact, we know in practice what it is. As far as I remember, this is one over n over d, if the coefficients of the game are Lipschitz and so on. So the result of this is to say that you have almost a Nash in the sense that if you deviate, maybe you can improve a little bit your state or your cost, but not that much. What you gain is really, really small when n tends to infinity. So in fact, the solution that you have as being given by the MFG is really accurate as it tells you that it's very simple to implement. You just have to see where you are. You don't care about the others, postulating that the others 
play the same strategy. And then if one guy tries to deviate, then the gain will be really, really small at most. And so this is almost an equilibrium. So I think that this is a good point for me to, to, to a good point for me to stop today. Um, so I will put, as I did yesterday, uh, the, the slides, maybe I will update a little bit a few things on the file sender. I will see whether I can use the same, uh, the same address or not, I think yes. I will put the PDF of the, of the pad as well on the, on the file sender. And so tomorrow, I will restart with something that is more difficult. Uh, this is what we call the master equation. And the objective is to regard the MFG system as a system of characteristics, exactly as we did for the Burgers equation, but now this is in infinite dimension. Okay, thank you. Many thanks to you, uh, Francois. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, very exciting part two and the nice and elegant proofs you have given there. Um, so now it's open for voice questions, if there are any among the audience. Yes, there's yes, one question. Amen. Uh, first, thank you for this uh, wonderful talk. Thank you. Uh, could you please, uh, uh, back to the, the formulation of uh, MFG, could yep. you please uh, tell us uh, uh, the main difference between the analytic and the probabilistic approaches? Mm -hmm. And uh, when it's better to use the, prob the probabilistic uh, formula instead of uh, the PDE. Yes. So th th thank you for the for the question. So so um, indeed, this was my choice to to formulate things first in terms of the PDE system. So the PDE system, this is this one. This was my choice because. At the end of the day, even though you use a probabilistic approach, you are quite happy to use estimates on the HJB equation. Um, this is not always the case, but many, many times, this is something that you are happy to have. So this is one of the main reasons why I studied from the PD, PD approach. And another one is that Okay, this is certainly in the origin works of Las Réunions, this was, this was formulated in this way. But you're completely right to say that the probabilistic approach makes sense as well. And in fact, this is even more my, my, my own speci speciality. So, so, so this is something that I like also. So now you say, what are the differences? Um, so in the, in the probabilistic approach, so you really follow that's the difference, in fact, between probability and PD. In PD, this is, you sit down, you sit down at a given time and a, a given position, and then you see how much you have to pay to the end. Uh, in the probabilistic approach, you follow the motion of a particle. And since the motion is probabilistic or is, is stochastic, then you have to pay for that and your equation becomes stochastic. So this is a kind of Lagrangian formulation. Okay. Now you could say, um, well, I'm trying to see where is my uh, where is my equation. No, this was after that. Yeah, this was this one. So the first, uh, no, this one here. So now if you want to solve this forward backward system, so In order to solve that, you will make a fixed point, exactly as I did. So this will be the same. If you know, it seems that you know a probability. So if you go to the original argument of Schnittmann for solving a mackin of stochastic differential equation, what Schnittmann does is that he freezes first the mean field dependence, so the law of the solution, and then he makes a fixed point on this. Here, this would be the same. In red color, you have the law of the, of the solution. So you would freeze the law of this for a given candidate, mu t for being the law of the solution, I would solve the forward backward system. So if I had to formulate my fixed point, 
I would replace this by some mu t and I would solve for this equation. And then I would try to say at the end of the day, I wanna get the law of xt is equal to mu t. And my claim is that if you do that, at the end of the day, this won't be so different from what I did with the PD approach because I know even though you attack this equation directly by using probabilistic arguments, I know that the solution will be given by u of mu t x t and the same for z t, z t will be the gradient. And so I know that when I will solve by Schauder theorem, in fact, what I'm going to do is to use the same kind of estimates on u of mu and dx u of mu. So there are not so many differences. And in fact, if you go to the probabilistic proofs that exist, certainly you will find, you will find certainly some references to the HAB equation. So here this is, if I use the first formulation uh, with forward backward stochastic differential equation, so which is really based on a representation of, of the cost. Now there is this other approach that is a bit different, which is based on Pontry again, which is this one. And this one here now you say, I'm playing the same game, but now this is for the, uh, uh, for the, for the optimal feedback and I have a new system. And I could do the same. I could say, well, is it possible to make the fixed points? You could. So you would replace once again, this by mu t, this by mu capital T, and you would do the fixed points. But now it turns out that possibly you can have direct proofs for this. Because in fact, if you know, and once again, it seems that you know probability, Pontry again works really well as a sufficient condition when you have a lot of convexity, which is what I told you before. And here it's going to be the same, even though you have the mean field dependence. And so you could require a kind of convexity somewhere so that this Pontry against system becomes directly uniquely solvable, even in presence of the law of the mean field, of the, of the mean field components. The difficulty to write this properly is to say what it means monotonicity or convexity. This is not the same type of convexity or monotonicity that the one I mentioned uh, from Las Réunions. This is another one that is uh, connected with convexity or monotonicity in optimal transportation. This is what people call displacement convexity. Anyway, you would be able to have a direct proof under these displacement convex assumptions. And this is something that I did somehow with René uh, in a paper that appeared in the Annals of Probability. Uh, this was, I think this was uh, 16. We were solving mean field control problem. Mean field control is not exactly a mean field game, but if you have a look, the mean field control is, is an optimization problem uh, of mean field type, let's say. And if you have a look at the Pontry again system for mean field control, this is a mean field game. And in fact, I could regard this as the Pontry again system of the problem that is studied in the paper with Carmona. And then therein, in this paper, what we explain is that if we had a lot of convexity in the original problem, which would give me a lot of monotonicity in this new problem, then we can directly solve this system without any use, without any use of the HJB equation, just by arguing by monotonicity. So, if you are really interested in the differences, I think that this is one, one possible difference. And it turns out to be really useful if you plug in addition, what I call a common noise. If you randomize the state of the environment, as I said before, then you no longer have a HAB equation. The HAB equation becomes stochastic. 
But the good point is that the Pontryagin system almost have the same, almost has the same shape. And so the analysis would be more or less the same. And now what about the name for the analysis? This is what we call the continuation method. This was something that Peng wrote a long time ago in a paper in 99 for solving forward backward stochastic equation. This is the continuation method and you could do this directly. So this is to say that somehow you're right to say that there are other assumptions that can be useful or that can be or for which the probabilistic approach can be useful directly without any reference to the uh, to the HJB uh, focal plank system. So I think this is an illustration. Now, if you want to push further into this, there have there has been uh, recent there have been recent papers by uh, Gongbo, Mezzaros, uh, Zhang, Mu. All these guys are in the US and certainly in UCLA. And they have revisited in some way this, not the, the probabilistic approach, but, but the use of displacement convexity. And in my mind, when I saw the paper, so the papers are really interesting, I'm not saying the converse, but when I saw the papers, in my mind, I thought of a probabilistic formulation of this type. So this is once again to argue the fact that probabilistic interpretation can be useful um, for analyzing the minfield gaze. Now, the very last point I have to say is that another advantage of the probabilistic formulation is for passing to the limit. So this is the, the north face that I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago. Um, this is a difficult question. And tomorrow or, or Thursday, we will see a, a PDE solution, which was my, a formulation that, uh, on which I worked, so I, I know it quite well. But there is another approach which was uh, uh, developed among others by Daniel, Daniel Laker, who did a wonderful work using the notion of relaxed control. And the idea is to say that when you try to pass to the limit on the shape of the equilibria of the end player problem, you need some capacity on this and the theory of relaxed control is really, really useful. And then having a probabilistic approach is useful, but you don't really use forward backward equation to do that. You directly work on the shape of the uh, stochastic control directly. And there is no need to formulate uh, forward backward stochastic differential equation. So this is somehow another probabilistic formulation directly in terms of the shape of the uh, stochastic control problem and you use capacity, very weak notion of capacity to pass to the limit on that. So this is another advantage of another probabilistic approach. And I'm sorry, I refer to, to all the works of Daniel, Daniel Laker. So this is Laker, so who is in uh, Colombia in, uh, in New York. Uh, and so he did a, a wonderful work. And I have to say that, uh, I expect uh, a volume in the AMS in the AMS to 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 be uh, to be released soon. So um, I worked on that, and Daniel uh, accepted to write a chapter on on this method. So hopefully you will get a chapter in a few months where Daniel explains all these weak compactness arguments based on the probabilistic formulation that uh, that he knows very well. I don't know whether this was uh, this was a long, long answer, but I don't know if this answer really well to your question. In fact, yes, thank you. Uh, another thing: uh, uh, is there any preferences? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, can we say that uh, the probabilistic or the analytic approach is uh, better for uh, this application? Or no, I, I cannot say it better. I understand your question. This is absolutely a natural question. Uh, in my mind, it depends on the on the context. It depends on the, as I told you, for instance, in linear quadratic, many times people use Pontry again because then things become become linear, and then this is very useful to have Pontry again, and then to use the probabilistic approach. But now, I, I, this is possible to redo the computation by using the HJB equation. So I think. 
my answer is, is in fact that I think really good to have the good the the two point of view because then you can pass from one point of view to the other one and sometimes you you feel better to use arguments from the first one and at some other times you feel better to use the arguments from the other approach. But I told you maybe for the convergence problem now this theory of uh, relaxed controls is um, is really really useful and maybe this is another advantage or one advantage of this probabilistic approach that I mentioned. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? Voice questions or written questions? Uh, if not, so uh, Francois, I have a, a very quick and maybe new by question. Uh, just to, uh, maybe I missed it, when, when you start by freezing the environment, then you compute, uh, then you compute the um, uh, state of the, let's say the XT, knowing mu T. Mm -hmm. um, what about the terminal condition on mu T that needs to know XT before? You know? Uh, no, at this time you don't know it yet. So it depends. No, if you freeze muty, if you freeze muty, it is given. So this is fine. Yes. But at, at the end of the day, uh, the terminal state will be given. This will be given implicitly. Okay. As part of the fixed point. Now your question is to say, maybe maybe we could have things as in optimal transportation, uh, where we fix uh, we fix. Uh, Initial and bound uh, initial and terminal states for the population. Um, you have uh, this is what we call planning problems. This is not exactly mean field games, but this is connected. And you can find some uh, planning problems. Uh, I think by Ashdu, uh, Ashdu did the uh, things in this in this sense. But in what I in what I said, at the end of the day, mu t will be implicitly uh, given by by the fixed points. And if you want to, to prescribe as an optimal transportation, the, the terminal boundary state, this is more of planning problems. Okay. Okay. But this is Thank another you. part of the theory, yeah. Okay. Thank you. So uh, it's uh, time to let you take a rest. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for this uh, second part. And we shall meet tomorrow or the third part that, if I understand, will be dedicated to the master equation? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah? Okay. Absolutely.